some performers appear in just a single scene and become what we remember about a film or TV show for years to come. Others take the full weight of a story from start to finish. We're here today to celebrate the life and work of one of those rare performers who does both flawlessly and unforgettably. Please welcome the one and only Viola Davis. I think you may have a few fans. <laughs> in just a few. And I wonder what you could share with us about your childhood, and I guess specifically how it shaped you as an actress. I mean, I grew up in, I always say, abject poverty because I hear so many people say, I grew up poor too. There were times when we didn't even have breakfast. No, I grew up po. That's a rung. <laughs> that's a rung lower than poor. I didn't have breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You know, you could do the math. If you have a mom who has an eighth grade education, a father who has a fifth grade education, and his skill was he groomed horses. He groomed some of the most famous horses in history, but he was a groom. And we moved to Central Falls, Rhode Island when I was two months, three months old. And so we lived in Rhode Island in abject poverty and condemned buildings that were infested with rats a lot of times. Almost never did we have hot water. Plumbing never worked, never had a phone. It always feels as from outside the profession that a lot of acting is about confidence or about drawing on a kind of inner strength. And I wonder, I mean, that surely your upbringing left you with, with confidence to make up. I don't necessarily feel that acting is about confidence. I feel it's about sensitivity. I feel it's about being a keen observer of life and being affected by the things that you do see. I imagine that most people probably, it's like Harry Potter, they go to the, the train station and most people are not even aware that they're walking through, you know, walls and all of that. That's how an actor is. Actors walk through life almost like ghosts. They're the ones who see everything. Idiosyncrasies, the mess, the shortcomings, they soak it up. And that's what I did in my life. I knew all the drug dealers. I knew the people who were the pedophiles. I knew the people who were the town drunks. I you know, knew all the people who went to jail. Um, and I looked and I watched. It really has been those kind of observations that has informed my work much more than confidence. Are you still a people watcher now? All the time. I watch people all the time, which can be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, when you're watching, sometimes you can forget to be kind of in life when you're observing it. With the screen, I wonder what your relationship was like with the screen as a, as a child, with movies and TV. I mean, was it just escapism that you wanted, or was there a deeper connection? All of it. I loved it. My sisters and I lived for, you know, every year, the Ten Commandments, every year, Willy Wonka, Wizard <laughs> of Oz, Christopher Lee. Loved Christopher Lee. Um, we soaked it up. And... From a very young age, I can always distinguish the actors from just the mere entertainers. So at what point do you move from that, from that kind of appreciation of, of acting, to thinking, actually, you know what, I'm going to do this myself, and then you start on a road which I guess then takes you to Juilliard, ultimately? Well, Miss Tyson is the one who was the game changer. Game changer, absolutely. I can mark the day I wanted to be an actor. Watching that performance, her age from 18 to 103 was it on a stick. I could not believe that it was the same woman. I watched how she used her hands and her mouth and the fact that she looked, at, uh, looked like me. Because when you see a physical manifestation of someone who looks like you doing something that magnificent, then it makes you believe you can do it. And when a love is ignited, a love of the craft, not a love of celebrity, you want to do it in every capacity you can. I think that's where a lot of young actors, not all, but a lot of young actors go wrong. I mean, I have performed 
church basements, basketball courts. I have performed in a theater where there was only one person in that, in that audience. Every chance I got, I wanted to do that. And the goal was to be as good as Miss Tyson. Stage acting is, from everyone I know that's, that's acted on stage, it's tough and it's, it's kind of lonely as well. I forget who said it, that acting is about standing in front of an audience naked and turning around very slowly. <laughs> I guess you wanted to, to do screen work and to actually combine the stage and the screen or to, to maybe concentrate on screen. It's stuff. not a matter of wanting, it's just, that's what you do as an actor. I listen to people all the time saying, you want to be a stage actor, a TV actor, a screen actor? And I'm thinking, what does that mean? <laughs> I wanted to be an actor. Your, your agent calls and says, I have an audition for you. Like, okay. And you know what? I'm gonna just be honest, is sometimes you do it for the money. Because 95% of us are unemployed at any given time. These, all these people you see up here le represent 0.007% of the profession. For the most part, a lot of the roles you get are going to be really shitty. <laughs> but guess what? You still have to dig into that role and do the work, okay? That's the career of an actor. So I don't care what I'm doing. I, I, I'm an equal opportunity actor. Sure. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, it was like 2000 or something. I think it was the first time I saw you. It was in Law and Order. Oh, that was Law and Order Criminal Intent. Right, okay. I loved. Right. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wanted to find out how that was for you. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> I love playing that role. Um, yeah, I played a serial killer. I think she kills a family with a baseball bat. It was refreshing to play someone who literally was way more complicated in their pathology. That was not necessarily likable or not likable, but someone, something different. Something different to show that we are indeed complicated, that we do have a pathology that's not necessarily just kind of four things that I always play. You just put, okay, we're gonna play strong today. We're gonna play sassy today. <laughs> so I always hate when I've tried so hard to make the character complicated and I see a review written by someone who's a great reviewer and the adjective they always use is, and Viola giving, giving a very soulful performance. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> The thing that stayed with me about that performance as well was the amount of time that you were on screen as well, because it was a great role for you to kind of sink your teeth into. You had kind of great little nuggety parts in some interesting movies, but then you were here and gone, and that must have been a little bit frustrating. Let me tell you something. All of it is frustrating. When... I, I don't care if I'm in 15 scenes. The first question I'm going to ask, who is she? Who does she love? What are her secrets? Did she have sex that morning? Did she? If you haven't asked any of those questions, but you put me in a lot of scenes, then it's just as bad as being in two scenes and having no name. The most revolutionary thing you can do is write a human being. That's it. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about doubt, because doubt suddenly, after... 15 years of doing screen work, suddenly doubt becomes this landmark role. Mm -hmm. Suddenly people are very, very aware of you. I wonder how, how much competition there was, first of all, to get that role and what the kind of audition process... Right, OK. Tell us a little bit about that. Whenever there's a great role out there for a woman of colour, everyone has auditioned for it. <laughs> and you know what? Here's the thing, too. You can get a little egotistical by saying, oh, my God, I'm going to audition for this. I really want this role. And I auditioned for it, and I got a call back. Seven different actresses. Wow. Everyone from Audrey McDonald to Taraji P. Henson, everyone was on that call sheet. And we each had 45-minute sessions to screen test. Everyone is being put in hair and makeup. So you see uh, seven different Mrs. Millers. <laughs> and my favorite part, is you hear all their auditions. 
And you hear everyone going, oh my God, she knocked it out of the ballpark. <laughs> oh my God. So to answer your question, yes, it was very wow. difficult. Wow, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good answer. Who'd be an actor, mm -hmm. I mean, really? You mentioned preparation a moment ago, and I wonder with Mrs. Miller, I mean, how much preparation had you done? A lot. Right. I could not understand that character. And this is not a slight to John Patrick Shanley, but there is a bit of an allegorical, metaphoric element to doubt. Almost Mrs. Miller being a device to present an idea. An idea of if you do have a son who could, who is gay, and whose father beats him every day because he know he's gay, then I don't care if this man is having sex with him. As long as he loves him, he's taking him under his wing, he's doing all of that, okay? I didn't get it. I, maybe because I'm a parent, I don't understand how a mother could sacrifice her son that way. And I did not want to play her like, Yes, I didn't want to make a judgment on her. I still, I thought it was more interesting in making her incredibly nurturing, but a woman who's willing to do that. So I had to write a bio that was, I stopped at about 100 pages, but it was about four months of calling everyone I knew and making them read it, talk about it, everything before I had my aha moment. What was your response the first time you saw that film? Because the actor is often you know, the last in line of the cast and crew to see, you know. I thought it was so horrific that I went home, I went to a restaurant in Santa Monica, and I had a salad to go and four bags of bread. And I went home and I laid down for maybe a week. And I said, Julius, this is gonna be the end of my career. It was horrible. I went to looping, it was horrible. And he said, well, what was Meryl doing in the scene? <laughs> and I said, I don't know what the hell she was doing. I wasn't looking at her. I was looking at me. We can say you were wrong about that. I think that's fair to say. But at what stage did you realise that actually people were latching onto the, to your performance in this movie more than any other factor? You're there with Meryl Streep, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, great actors all. But you walked away with that movie and you must have been aware that as soon as the first reviews came out, what people were talking about was you. Yeah, but, you know, it's not my style. That's what I always say. It's not my style. I mean, I get what people were saying. And I love that, because any actor who has the imposter syndrome, which is all of us, we don't want to be found out. I, you always want to be better. That's all. You always want to be better. Did things change in terms of the kind of work that you were being offered? I was just sort of offered more roles like like that in terms of the size. I was just getting paid a little bit more money. My career didn't change until after the help, and then it really hit after How to Get Away with Murder. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the help, because it's the 60s, it's the South, and I'm wondering when you first got that script whether there was an immediate sense of, okay, this is maybe something with my background that I have to do, because this is like personal history for me. I'm always trying to be honest in my interviews. Um, I knew it was a best-selling book, and I knew it would change my career. I love the premise of it. I love Tate Taylor, and I love, love, love all those women who were in it. I did feel like it was an important story. I had a lot of issues with the help. I love the fact that Skeeter said, I am going to write a story from the maid's perspective of what it feels like to work with these white women. Operative term meaning the maid's perspective. I don't feel like it was from our perspective. That's the problem I had with it. I had it from the very beginning. Now, there were a lot of things in the book that I did like, 
And then there were some things in the book I had issues with. Number one, that Skeeter would offer the women money to tell their stories, knowing that it's dangerous for them, knowing that they were meeting late at night in their homes. And I think at one point she offered someone $38. Um, the response with all the women were, no, Miss Skeeter, we don't want the money. We just want to tell our story. They would take the money. Abilene was not even eating in the book. She's eating preserves given to her by her neighbor. She's barely making a living wage. They would take the money. That's number one. Number two, the anger, the vitriol, and the hatred that they would have towards these white women if they were put in a situation where they were isolated would have been vocalized. You didn't see none of that. You saw many putting the shit in the pie. <laughs> but to be perfectly honest, I think a huge part of that, which I am so thankful it was in the book, but a huge part of that is comedic in nature. So it's, e it's an easier pill to swallow. And there was actually one scene where this one woman did express her anger. It was removed from the movie. But I still feel one of the reasons why this movie was so successful, and I do think fantastic actors love everybody in it, wonderful performances, is a lot of people were brought up with these co-mothers. They were brought up with these maids. These maids stood in the gap for a lot of people. And I think one of the reasons why they weren't shown as messy is because nobody wants to stain the memory of that black woman who loved them probably more than their mothers loved them. Yeah. They want to preserve that memory of them being loving and, you know, and so they want to keep them pure. In that case, let me talk to you about how to get away with murder, because you're working there. It's Shonda Rhimes, who is the creator mm. of this. And I wonder how different it is to actually work for a, for a black woman who is, who, it's her show. She owns that and you're working with her. So how different does that feel on a day-to-day -day basis? Completely different. Okay. I love it. I love every bit of it. Now, I am aware that it's a soap opera, that it's melodrama, that people don't, you know, see it the same way as, I don't know, a house of cards. But in the center of it is Annalise Keating, played by me. And what it affords me to do is play other adjectives. She's sexualized. She's sociopathic. She's messy. She's smart. She's all of those things. And the best part is you can't put your finger on her. And I love that because what it affords me to do is to redefine what it means to be a black woman who is 51. Still to this day, with everything that's on TV, I always say, who is on TV like me? Who is having sex with women, men? You know, a white man, black man, white woman like Framka Jensen. Who, who's going to think of that? Who's going to look at me and go, bisexual? Oh, let's put her with Billy Brown. Let's put her with Tom Verica. Let's put her in the courtroom. You know, let's make her an alcoholic. And so I saw Annalise Keating as an opportunity to explore all of that to see why, to ask the question, why is she sociopathic? Why is she sexual? Every time I see a woman who plays sexual, if she switches her hips and walks in heels like she's been on the runway for five years, I mean, we don't walk like that. <laughs> it's like there's a difference between sexy and sexual. Yeah. I wanted to play sexual. I just felt like I scored in How to Get Away with Murder. You're open, and it's brilliant to hear it, about being quite strategic about your career. I read that you did the movie Black Hat, the Michael Mann movie, partly at least, because it was going to it's going to be a big thing in Southeast Asia, so it was a Absolutely. chance to, to broaden your... I mean, it's, do you realise how rare it is to actually talk about that stuff openly? Because, again, most actors and actresses won't. They'll put their career down to happy accidents. But you're very upfront about the fact that this is like a planned thing. 
you're driven artistically, but also professionally. Absolutely. Because I think that that's one thing they say to actors of color is that you don't translate internationally. A lot of times they won't even release the film internationally or they'll release the film like 12 Years a Slave, there'll be a big poster of Brad Pitt and a tiny little picture of Chiwetel running in the... <laughs> it's gotta change. It's gotta change. The world is not the same anymore. It's not the Brady Bunch. And we know more. Art has got to reflect that, you know? Um, and I think what's going to happen is the audience is going to demand it. And I think, you know, what it is, it's a holding on to the past. And a lot of money-making people, I think it's rooted in fear. I just want to talk very quickly about fences, which obviously is the one thing we haven't really dealt with. You've got this long-standing relationship with August Wilson, with Denzel Washington. You've played this part before on stage. So I wonder, was there ever a point where you thought, well, actually, maybe having played this quite recently, 2010, on stage, maybe, maybe this is too close. Maybe actually this is a role, maybe I should move on to other things. Or did you always think, I'm doing fences, that's my movie? I always said, I'm doing fences. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. I mean, I don't know how you turn up a role like this, August Wilson, to have that kind of character who is so complete in her journey, so complete. Sometimes you've got to force a journey. I was so tired of making um, things work, getting together with the director and rewriting things. I was so tired of that. This, you didn't have to do any of it. Um, and to be with Denzel, the same actors who did it on Broadway, which almost never happens, um, and to shoot it in Pittsburgh, absolutely. And it's different. I wonder if people understand how different this is. When, when have you ever seen this? I mean, there are scenes where there are 11 page monologues, where you have actors who collectively, Stephen McKinley Henderson, 40 some -odd years in the business. Michael T, 50 years. Russell Hornsby, 20 something years. I've been in the business 30 years. Journeyman actors have really been out there just fighting the good fight. I remember I did a uh, reading with Lynn Redgrave before she passed. And she said when she left Los Angeles, um, she said, I was surprised. I had been there for so many years and I just left. Nobody was trying to make me stay. And uh, she said she felt like her past didn't count for anything. And I think there's a slew of journeyman actors, like the actors that I worked with in here, who sometimes people don't understand. They've been around doing great work. And this is the reward, you know? So, yeah, I was always going to do it. It's a la another landmark, I think, in a career full of landmarks. We're going to have to leave it there. It doesn't get much smarter or much better than Viola Davis. Thank you, Viola.